Good afternoon, class. Uh, today we're going to start uh, Unit 2. Uh, so the first part of Unit 2, uh, it's, um, this unit is a chemistry unit. Uh, I bet you're wondering why are we doing chemistry and anatomy and physiology, uh, but chemistry is uh, very important because um, a lot of those, uh, uh, the process of digestion, uh, cardiovascular system, uh, are related to uh, to chemistry. So it's uh, we're going to cover very basic chemistry. Our study of the human body begins at the chemical level of organization. Uh, the body is made up of many chemicals. Uh, chemistry underlines underlies all physiological reactions uh, such as movement, uh, digestion, pumping of the heart, our nervous system. And chemistry can be broken down into basic chemistry and biochemistry. So we'll start with ba uh, basic chemistry. <laughs> Part one, basic chemistry. Chemistry is the science that deals with the structure of matter. Uh, defined as anything that takes up space and has mass. Mass is a physical property that determines the weight of an object in the Earth's gravitational field. For our purposes, the mass of an object is the same as its weight. If we were to ride on the space shuttle, however, we would find that the two are not always equivalent. In orbit, we would be weightless, but our mass would remain unchanged. Matter exists in solid, liquid, and gaseous states. Uh, examples of each state are found in the human body. Solids like bones and teeth have a definite shape and volume. Uh, liquids such as blood, plasma have a definite volume, but they conform to the shape of their container. Gases have neither a definite shape nor a definite volume. The air we breathe is a gas. This figure illustrates uh, the difference between a solid, a liquid, and a gas. So a solid is rigid, it has a fixed shape and a fixed volume, whereas a liquid is not rigid, it has no fixed shape, but it does have a fixed volume. And a gas is not rigid, it has no fixed, sh fixed shape and no fixed volume. Work is movement or a change in the physical structure of matter. Energy is the capacity to perform work. Movement or physical change cannot occur unless energy is provided. Uh, energy does not have mass, nor does it take up space. The greater the work done, the more energy it uses up. The two major types of energy are kinetic energy and potential energy. Uh, kinetic energy is the energy of motion, uh, energy that is doing work. When you fall off a ladder, it is kinetic energy that does the damage. Potential energy is stored energy, uh, energy that has the potential to do work. It may derive from an object's position or from its physical or chemical structure. Energy can be transformed from potential to kinetic energy, and stored energy can be released, resulting in action. Kinetic energy must be used uh, in climbing the hill. Uh, the resulting potential energy is converted back into kinetic energy when, uh, when the person uh, bikes down the, uh, the hill. And the kinetic energy can then be used to perform work. Chemical energy is the form stored in the bonds of chemical substances. When chemical reactions occur that rearrange the atoms of the chemicals in a certain way, the potential energy is unleashed and becomes kinetic energy or energy in action. Uh, electrical energy results from the movement of charged particles. In your body, electrical currents are generated when charged particles move along or across cell membranes. Uh, mechanical energy is energy directly involved in moving matter. So, for example, when you ride a bicycle, your legs provide the me mechanical energy that moves the pedals. Radiant or electromagnetic radiation is energy that travels in waves. These waves, which vary in length, are collectively called the electromagnetic spectrum. 
They include radio waves, microwaves, infrared waves, visible light, ultraviolet waves, and x-rays. This figure gives the different examples, different forms of energy, uh, like mechanical energy, uh, when a, a frog leaps, for example, thermal uh, energy, when you heat a soup, electromagnetic, uh, so, it, you know, there's different, uh, different uh, wavelengths, uh, f like visible light, infrared versus radio waves, uh, electrical uh, chemical energy, this is the one we'll really focus on. Uh, you know, we derive energy from the foods that we eat. Uh, and then this energy is uh, transferred on to ATP, which is a stored potential energy that can be used up uh, for um, uh, when energy is needed to, to do more uh, cellular transformation. And then nuclear energy. Energy cannot be lost. It can only be converted from one form to another. A conversion between potential energy and kinetic energy is never 100% efficient. Each time an energy exchange occurs, some of the energy is released in the form of heat. Heat is an increase in random molecular motion. The temperature of an object is proportional to the average kinetic energy of its molecules. When energy is converted to heat, some usable energy is always lost. Because heat can never be completely converted to work or any other form of energy. Moreover, cells have no effective way of using heat to perform work. If we look at this figure on the left, uh, where you have the apple and the person riding a bike, uh, you know, cells perform work as they synthesize complex molecules from the foods that we, uh, that we eat and move the materials into, out of, and within the cell. Uh, and some cells are specialized for motion or contraction. Uh, for example, a skeletal muscle at rest contains potential energy in the form of positions of protein filaments and the covalent bonds between molecules inside the, the cell. When a muscle contracts, it performs work. Potential energy is converted into kinetic energy and the heat is released. The amount of heat is proportional to the amount of work done. As a result, when you exercise, your body temperature rises. Uh, the other uh, figures, uh, conversions, chemical to light, electrical to light, chemical to mechanical, light to chemical, that would be in the process of photosynthesis, electrical to heat, we don't really cover so much in, uh, in our anatomy and physiology. In section 2.2, atoms and elements, uh, all matter is composed of elements. Elements are substances that cannot be broken down into simpler substances by ordinary chemical methods. Uh, there are four elements that make up 96% of the body, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Uh, so carbon is a component of all organic molecules, uh, such as carbohydrates, lipids, uh, which are fats and oils, proteins and nucleic acids. Um, oxygen is a component of both organic and inorganic molecules. Um, hydrogen is a component of all organic molecules. And uh, it's uh, as an ion or proton, it is uh, very important in the pH of body fluids. Uh, nitrogen is a component of proteins and nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are what determine our genetic material. Um, Nine elements make up 3.9% of the body. These would include uh, calcium, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, sodium, chlorine, magnesium, iodine, and iron. Eleven elements make up less than 0.01% um, of the body. They're really found in trace amounts. Uh, so uh, examples would be chromium, cobalt, copper, fluorine, manganese, selenium, silicone, uh, zinc. Uh, the periodic table lists all known elements. A listing of the elements by increasing order of atomic number appears in the periodic table. Uh, this is just to show you what a periodic table is. It's commonly seen in chemistry class. The smallest stable units of matter are called atoms. Air, elephants, oranges, oceans, rocks, and people are all composed of atoms in varying combinations. 
Um, the unique characteristics of each object, living or non-living, result from the types of atoms involved and the ways those atoms combine and interact. So atoms are unique building blocks for each element. Uh, they're the smallest particles of an element with properties of that element. And atoms are what give each element its particular physical and chemical properties. The atomic symbol is a one or two letter chemical shorthand for each element. For example, O is for oxygen, C denotes carbon. Uh, some symbols come from Latin names, so uh, uh, Na is uh, sodium, uh, but in Latin it's natrium. And uh, K is uh, potassium, but in Latin is kalium. Uh, again, to summarize, uh, Table 2.1 uh, shows the common elements composing the human body. So the most uh, predominant is oxygen at 65% of the uh, approximate body mass. Uh, so we said that it's a component of both uh, carbon-containing and non-carbon-containing molecules. Also, as a gas, it is very important for... Uh, in the process of cellular respiration to generate ATP. Carbon is the second most uh, uh, common element in the body, uh, and uh, it's, it's a component of all organic molecules, uh, which we're going to spend a lot of time on, the carbohydrates, the lipids, the proteins, and the nucleic acids. And hydrogen at 9.5% is also a component of organic molecules. And then nitrogen uh, is a major component of proteins and the nucleic acids. These uh, common elements uh, present in lesser amounts uh, are, however, very important in the body. Uh, for example, calcium, uh, which is found in bones and teeth, is, uh, uh, is important for muscle contraction, also the conduction of a nerve impulse and the process of blood clotting. Uh, phosphorus, uh, also found in bone, bones and teeth, uh, is found in uh, nucleic acids such as DNA and RNA and part of ATP. ATP we'll talk about a lot. It's uh, an energy molecule and also found in phospholipids. Phospholipids are the main components of membranes. Uh, potassium is the major cation or major positive ion in our cells. Uh, it's very important for the conduction of nerve impulses and the contraction of muscles. Uh, sulfur is a component of proteins. Um, sodium is uh, a, a major positive ion found in extracellular fluid compartment. Uh, it's very important in water balance and conduction of nerve impulses and, the, uh, and muscle contraction. Chlorine is the most abundant negative ion, also known as an anion, in the extracellular fluid compartment. Uh, magnesium is present in bones, important for metabolic reactions. Iodine is, um, uh, is, uh, is needed to make thyroid hormone uh, for metabolism. And iron is a component of hemoglobin, uh, and you, you know, hemoglobin in red blood cells for the transport of oxygen. Uh, these other elements, uh, these are found in very minute quantities in the human body, but they're very important components of uh, enzymes. Enzymes will learn uh, speed up chemical reactions and are very important for the, their activation, for the activation of enzymes. Atoms are composed of uh, subatomic particles. These are protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons and neutrons are similar in size and mass, but protons bear a positive electrical charge, whereas neutrons are, as the name suggests, electrically neutral or uncharged. Uh, electrons are much lighter than protons and bear a negative electrical charge. The mass of an atom is therefore determined primarily by the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. If you look at the uh, elements in the periodic table, uh, so for example, uh, the element uh, HE stands for helium, uh, and uh, the top number is the atomic number, so it's the uh, how many protons 
helium has. And then at the bottom, it's the atomic mass or the uh, mass number, and it's four. So that would be that, that would, uh, what that implies is that uh, it has two protons and two neutrons. Because remember, uh, uh, electrons do not carry, uh, do not have a mass. The number of positive protons is balanced by the number of negative electrons. So atoms are electrically neutral. Uh, protons and neutral, uh, neutrons, as we saw in the figure, are found in a centrally located nucleus, and the electrons orbit around the nucleus. Uh, chemists devise models of how subatomic partic particles are put together, uh, for example, the planetary model and the orbital model. The uh, planetary model is uh, simplified and it's uh, also uh, not really accurate because it, uh, it shows uh, electrons in orbits or fixed circular paths, uh, which is not accurate because we can never determine the, the exact location of electrons at a particular time because they jump around following unknown trajectories. Uh, it's still useful, but usually the, uh, what's the current model is the orbital model uh, that's used to depict orbitals, uh, probable regions where an electron is most likely to be located, located rather than fixed orbits. Uh, shading in regions of greatest electron density results in an electron cloud around the nucleus, and it's useful for predicting chemical behavior, behavior of atoms. Figure 2.1 shows the orbital versus the planetary model to, uh, uh, you know, just to look at the uh, structure of uh, helium. Uh, the helium atom, remember he helium had two protons, two neutrons, and two electrons. So in the orbital model, uh, the electrons are represented as a cloud of negative charge, whereas in the planetary model, uh, the electrons are shown as two small spheres on a circle around the nucleus. So from the periodic table, you saw that different elements contain different numbers of subatomic particles. Hydrogen has one proton, no uh, zero neutrons, and one electron, uh, because remember, they're electrically uh, uh, balanced. Uh, or uncharged. Uh, helium has two protons, two neutrons, and two electrons. Lithium has three protons, four neutrons, and three electrons. We don't have to memorize these. Uh, th this is just uh, to explain the, uh, uh, you know, the, you know, the concept of mass, mass number, and uh, atomic weight. Uh, sorry, mass, atomic number, mass number, uh, isotop isotopes, and atomic weight. Figure 2.2 shows the atomic structure of the three smallest atoms, uh, hydrogen, helium, and lithium. So hydrogen, again, has one proton, no neutrons, and one orbiting electron. Uh, helium has two protons, two neutrons, and two orbiting electrons. And lithium has three protons. Uh, it has um, uh, four neutrons, and it has uh, three uh, orbiting electrons. And because uh, the maximum amount of electrons in the first orbit is two, uh, then you have another, orb another uh, electron shell for the third one. So the at atomic number versus the mass number. Uh, so the atomic number is the number of protons in the nucleus, and it's written as a subscript, subscript to the left of the atomic symbol like in this case, uh, the three for lithium. Uh, mass number is the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus uh, of the element, and so it's the total mass of the atom, and it's written as a superscript to the left of the atomic symbol, and in the case of lith lithium, it would be seven. Isotopes are structural variations of the same element. Uh, atoms of isotopes contain the same number of protons but differ in the number of neutrons they contain. Atomic numbers are the same, but the mass, mass numbers would be different. Uh, the atomic weight is the average of mass numbers of all the isotopes uh, of an atom. So for example, for hydrogen, there are three isotopes. There's hydrogen one with one proton and one electron, 
Hydrogen 2, also known as deuterium, with one proton, one electron, and one neutron. And hydrogen 3, or tritium, with one proton, one electron, and two neutrons. The nuclei of some isotopes spontaneously emit subatomic particles or radiation in measurable amounts. Such isotopes are called radioisotopes, and the emission process is called radioactive decay. Strongly radioactive isotopes are dangerous because the emissions can break molecules apart, destroy cells, and otherwise damage living tissues. Weakly radioactive isotopes are sometimes used in diagnostic procedures to monitor the structural or functional characteristics of internal organs. So, uh, so radioisotopes are a valuable tool for biological research and medicine. Uh, they share the same chemistry as their stable isotopes, so will be taken up by the body. And, of course, they can be used for diagnosis of disease. Uh, all radioactivity can damage living tissue. Uh, and um, some types can be used to destroy localized cancers, uh, and some types can cause cancer. So radon from uranium decay causes lung cancer. Nuclear medicine is the use of radiopharmaceuticals for the diagnosis and treatment of diseases. Radioactive tracers are commonly used in nuclear diagnostics. They are carrier molecules bonded to a radioactive atom and can be tracked by a detector. Techniques like PET or positron emission tomography utilize radioactive tracers and a scanner to produce three-dimensional images. In PET, a radioactive tracer is injected or swallowed. As it decays, the tracer emits positrons that collide with nearby electrons and release radiation. Diseased tissues, such as cancerous tumors, absorb the tracer at a relatively high rate. These areas show up as bright spots on the image that is produced by the scanner. SPECT, or Single Photon Emission Computed Tomography, is similar to PET. However, the radioactive tracer emits gamma rays that are detected by cameras to produce an image. SPECT is useful for diagnosing heart disease, Alzheimer disease, and stroke. Diagnostic radionuclides have short half-lives, sometimes less than a day, in order to limit the radiation dose on the patient. Examples of treatments that use nuclear medicine include brachytherapy and gamma knife radiosurgery. In brachytherapy, a sealed radioactive source is placed inside the body, in or near the tumor. High doses of radiation in close range of the tumor allow for targeted destruction of localized cancer cells. In gamma knife radiosurgery, the radionuclide is not directly placed inside the body. Instead, an instrument called a gamma knife delivers beams of radiation to the head in order to treat tumors within the skull. The half-lives of radionuclides used for treatments are longer than those used for diagnostics, allowing for extended treatment of the disease. Most, uh, so um, uh, section 2.3, combining matter. We're going to look at uh, differences between molecules and compounds. Uh, most atoms chemically combine with other atoms to form molecules and compounds. Uh, there are elements that do not readily participate in chemical processes. These are said to be inert. Uh, so elements like helium, neon, and argon have filled the outermost energy levels. And so we call these, uh, they're gases, actually they're called the inert gases because they don't, re they don't react with one another or combine with atoms of other elements. Uh, however, elements with unfilled outermost energy levels, such as hydrogen, are called reactive because they readily interact or combine with other atoms. So a molecule is a general term for two or more atoms bonded together, whereas a compound is a specific molecule that has two or more different kinds of atoms bonded together. 
Uh, an example is uh, glucose, uh, which is C6H12O6. Uh, so that means it has six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens. Uh, molecules with only one type of atom, like hydrogen or oxygen, are just called molecules. Most matter exists as mixtures, two or more components that are physically intermixed. There are three basic types of mixtures, solutions, colloids, and suspensions. Figure 2.4 shows examples of the three basic types of mixtures. Uh, so a solution, in a solution, solute particles are very tiny, do not settle out or scatter light. Uh, so an example is uh, mineral water with tiny little solute particles. Uh, colloids are, uh, in colloids, the solute particles are larger than in a solution and scatter light, and they do not settle out. An example is jello. And uh, in a suspension, solute particles are very large. They settle out and may scatter light. An example is blood. Uh, so when blood is settled, it's going to separate into plasma and the settled red blood cells at the bottom. Uh, so a little bit more detail about uh, solutions. Uh, so solutions are homogeneous mixtures, meaning particles are evenly distributed throughout. Solutions are made up of a solvent and solute or solutes. A solvent is the substance present in the greatest amount, usually a liquid such as water. Solutes are it's a substance dissolved in solvent and it's present in smaller amounts. Example, blood sugar. Uh, for uh, So uh, glucose is the solute that is um, uh, dissolved in the blood plasma, which is the solvent. True solutions are usually transparent. An example is air, which is a gas solution, a salt solution, uh, or a sugar solution. Uh, most solutions in the body are true solutions of gases, liquids, or solids dissolved in water. The... Um, uh, concentration of two of true solutions can be expressed in three ways. Uh, so the first one is percent of solute in the total solution. So that is how many parts of solute are in 100 total parts of solution. So the solvent is usually water. So an example is 10 parts salt to 90 parts water is a 10% salt solution. Another way of, uh, of uh, expressing concentration is through milligrams per deciliter. A deciliter is one one-hundredth of a liter. For example, normal fasting blood glucose levels are around 80 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, and the third way is through molarity. Molarity is the number of moles of solute per liter of solvent, which is water. Uh, one mole of a compound is equal to its molecular weight in grams. So, uh, for example, glucose has a molecular weight of 180.12 AMUs. So 180.12 grams of glucose added to enough water to make one liter is a one molar solution of glucose. And one mole of any substance always contains 6.02 times 10 to the 23 molecules of that substance. And this is its Avogadro's number. Molarity in the body is so small. It can be like 0.001 molar. And it's usually expressed in millimoles. Uh, and uh, one, a thousand millimoles, millimoles is equal to, is equivalent to one molar. Colloids are also referred to as emulsions. Uh, remember, they're heterogeneous mixtures, meaning that the particles are not evenly distributed throughout the mixture. Uh, we can see large solute particles in solution, but these do not settle out and gives the solution a cloudy or milky look. Some undergo go sol gel, solution to gel transformations. For example, jello goes from liquid to gel. And an example of a colloid is the cytosol of, of cells. Uh, suspensions are heterogeneous mixtures that contain large visible solutes that do settle out. Example uh, is the mixture if you, you know, if you mix water with sand. Uh, and in the human body, blood is considered a suspension because if left in a tube, the blood cells will settle out. The three main differences between mixtures and compounds are one, 
Unlike compounds, mixtures do not involve chemical bonding between the components. Mixtures, the uh, second one is that the mixtures can be separated by physical means, such as straining or filtering. However, compounds can be separated only by breaking their chemical bonds, so you have to uh, invest energy to do that. And thirdly, mixtures can be heterogeneous or homogeneous, whereas compounds are only homogeneous. Next section, 2.4, chemical bonds. So chemical bonds are energy relationships between electrons of reacting atoms. Chemical bonds are not actual physical structures. And when chemical bonding occurs, the result is the creation of molecules and compounds. Uh, electrons are the subatomic particles that are involved in all chemical reactions, and they determine whether a chemical reaction will take place, and if so, what type of chemical bond is formed. Atoms are electrically neutral. Uh, every positively charged proton is balanced by a negatively charged electron. Thus, each increase in the atomic number is accompanied by a comparable increase in the number of electrons orbiting the nucleus. Within the electron cloud, electrons occupy an orderly series of electron levels. Although the electrons in an energy level may travel in complex orbits around the nucleus, for our purposes, the orbits can be diagrammed as a series of concentric electron shells. The first electron shell, the one closest to the nucleus, corresponds to the closest energy level. Um, shells can hold only a specific number of electrons. The shell closest to the nucleus is filled first. So shell 1 can hold only 2 electrons, shell 2 holds a maximum of 8 electrons, and shell 3 holds a maximum of 18 electrons. The outermost electron shell is called the valence shell. Electrons in the valence shell have the most potential energy because they are farthest from the nucleus. Uh, these electrons that are involved, and these are the electrons that are involved in chemical reactions. The key to chemical re reactivity is the octet rule or rule of eights. Uh, this is when atoms, well, this is known on the uh, known by the fact that atoms desire eight electrons in their valence shell. Exceptions are smaller atoms like uh, hydrogen and helium, what, which want only two electrons in shell one. Uh, the um, here, you know, most atoms desire to have electron eight electrons. Uh, which is a driving force behind the chemical reaction. Uh, noble gases already have the full eight valence electrons, or two for helium, so we already said that they are not really chemically reactive. But most atoms do not have full valence shells, and this is why they participate in, uh, in chemical bonding, because these atoms will gain, lose, or share electrons to form the bonds with other atoms to achieve stability of eight electrons in the valence shell. As, as indicated in figure 2.5a, uh, we're looking at chemically inert and reactive elements. Uh, so the first group here, these are chemically inert, uh, helium and neon. So a, a helium atom has two electrons in its first energy level. Because its outer energy level is filled, a helium atom is very stable. It will not ordinarily react with other atoms. And the same goes for neon. Uh, its uh, second uh, energy level is filled with eight electrons, so it will not, uh, it will not react with other atoms. In figure... Um, in part B, we're looking at chemically reactive elements. Uh, so hydrogen, uh, a hydrogen atom readily reacts with other hydrogen atoms or with the atoms of other elements uh, because a hydrogen atom has one electron in the first energy level and the level is still Un, it's thus unfulfilled. Uh, the same goes with carbon. Carbon is uh, has four uh, electrons in its uh, outer uh, valence uh, um, electron shell, so it has a bonding capacity of four, and oxygen has six, so it, it has room for two more, and sodium has one electron uh, in its outer shell, so it still has lots of room to, uh, to, to accept electrons. There are three uh, major types of chemical bonds that occur in the uh, human body. 
ionic, covalent, and hydrogen bonds. As the name implies, ionic bonds form between ions. Ions are atoms or molecules that carry an electric charge, either positive or negative. Ions with a positive charge are called cations. Ions with a negative charge are called anions. Ionic bonds are chemical bonds created by the electrical attractions between anions and cations. Ions have an unequal number of protons and electrons. Ionic bonds involve the transfer of valence shell electrons from one atom to another, resulting in ions. One becomes an anion, which ha carries a negative charge. It's the atom that gained or one or more electrons. Uh, and one becomes a cation, which is a positive, carries a positive charge, and this atom has lost one or more electrons. Attraction of opposite charges results in an ionic bond. The formation of an ionic bond is uh, shown in figure 2.6a and b. So sodium, uh, the sodium atom has one uh, outer electron um, in its outer shell and it joins the seven outer electrons of chlorine and the result is a cation, uh, in other words a positively charged sodium and an anion or a negatively charged chloride, uh, which can form the ionic bond. Uh, the combination of, opposite of oppositely charged ions forms this uh, ionic compound, in this case sodium chloride, otherwise known as table salt. Although sodium chloride and other ionic compounds are common in body fluids, they are not present as intact crystals. When placed in water, ionic compounds dissolve and the component anions and cations separate. Figure 2.6c shows the formation of the uh, uh, salt crystal. Uh, large numbers of sodium and chloride ions associate to form NaCl crystals. Some atoms can completely can sorry can complete their outer electron shells not by gaining or losing electrons but by sharing electrons with other atoms. Such sharing creates covalent bonds between the atoms involved. Sharing of two electrons results in a single bond. Sharing of four electrons is a double bond. Sharing of six electrons is a triple bond. Uh, and this allows each atom to fill its valence shell at least part of the time. There are two types of covalent bonds, polar and nonpolar covalent bonds. Figure 2.7a shows uh, is an example of a formation of covalent bond. So let's say you have four hydrogen atoms and uh, you're combining it with a one carbon atom. Uh, the carbon shares four electron pairs with four hydrogen atoms. And the result is a molecule known as... Um, methane, methane gas. In figure 2.7b, uh, we have an example of a formation of a double covalent bond. Uh, so we have two oxygen atoms that are uh, the reacting atoms, and the two oxygen atoms share two electron pairs, and the result is a molecule of, of oxygen gas. Figure 2.7c illustrates the formation of a triple covalent bond. In this example, we have two nitrogen atoms that react together to form nitrogen gas, or uh, N2. Um, there are two, we said there are two types of covalent bonds. There's nonpolar and polar covalent bonds. We're going to look at the first one. In nonpolar covalent bonds, there's an equal sharing of electrons between atoms, and the result is an electrically balanced nonpolar polar molecule such as uh, CO2. Uh, Nonpolar covalent bonds, especially those between carbon atoms, create the stable framework of the large molecules that make up most of the structural components of the human body. In figure 2.8a, uh, we see an example of a nonpolar covalent bond. Uh, the example here is carbon dioxide. Uh, the resulting molecule is linear and symmetrical, and there's equal sharing of uh, uh, the uh, oxygens uh, with the uh, carbon. In polar covalent bonds, um, 
so covalent bonds involving different types of atoms may instead involve an unequal sharing of electrons because the element the elements differ in how strongly they attract electrons. Uh, so, and this the result is electrically polar molecules. Uh, here we see atoms having that have different electron attracting abilities will lead to unequal sharing. Atoms, for example, with greater electron attracting ability are electronegative, and those with less are electropositive. This table uh, shows the uh, difference in electronegativity between uh, different uh, atoms. Uh, so what does it, um, what does it, uh, what can we interpret from this? So the oxygen nucleus, for example, has a much stronger attraction for the shared electrons than the hydrogen atoms do. As a result, the electrons spend more time orbiting the oxygen nucleus than orbiting the hydrogen nuclei. A very good example of a polar covalent bond is seen in a molecule of water. So water is a polar molecule because it's made up of oxygen and hydrogen with differing electronegativities. And by the way, I forgot to mention, you don't need to memorize that uh, table that I showed you in the previous slide. So in the previous slide, if you remember, oxygen is more electronegative. So it exerts a greater pull on the shared electrons, giving it a partial negative charge and giving hydrogen a partial positive charge. Having two different charges is referred, referred to as a dipole. So any molecule that has two different charges uh, is, uh, is, is called dipole. But please note the overall water molecule is electrically neutral. Figure 2.8b shows an example of a, uh, of a polar covalent bond, uh, and the best example is water. Okay, so it, what does it show? It shows that uh, oxygen has, is more electronegative, so it has a slightly stronger pull than hydrogen, so it pulls the electrons closer to the oxygen nucleus, giving that area of the molecule a, a, a slightly more negative charge. Uh, and in so doing, the area of the molecule where you have hydrogen, uh, it would be more electropositive. Uh, so it, it, that's what a dipole is. Um, please note the unequal sharing of electrons makes polar covalent bonds somewhat weaker than nonpolar covalent bonds. Um, this fig figure 2.9 show is comparing ionic polar covalent and non-polar covalent bonds along a continuum with ionic bond uh, ionic bonds uh, being somewhat uh, being the weakest polar covalent bonds are somewhere in between and non-polar covalent bonds are the strongest so if we compare ionic bonds uh, so ionic just to recap ionic bonds involve the complete transfer of electrons they separate ions which are charged particles um, so separate ions form sorry uh, like sodium and chloride uh, are is an example uh, polar covalent bonds involve unequal sharing of electrons, the charge unbalanced among atoms, uh, so the molecule has a slightly positive and a slightly negative charge, but please note, again, I repeat, water is, uh, is uh, electrically neutral. It just has some areas, the oxygen area of the, uh, of the molecule is... Um, electronegative, whereas the hydrogens uh, are electropositive uh, because of the strong electro, the difference in electronegativity between oxygen and hydrogen, where oxygen has a stronger pull. Uh, in a nonpolar covalent bond, uh, this involves equal sharing of electrons, charge balanced among the atoms, and a very good example is carbon dioxide. 
The third type of chemical bond is called the hydrogen bonds. This is an attractive force between electropositive hydrogen of one molecule and an electronegative atom of another molecule. It's not a true bond. Uh, it's more of a weak magnetic attraction uh, common between dipoles such as water. And it's what is responsible for making water liquid. It also act, act, acts as an intramolecular bond holding a large molecule in a three-dimensional shape. When we look at the structure of DNA, for example, such a very large molecule is held together. Uh, the two strands of DNA are held together by many, many hydrogen uh, bonds. Uh, so a hydrogen bond on its own is, is very weak, but because there are so many of them, uh, it, uh, the collective action of hydrogen bonds is, uh, makes a molecule very stable. Uh, we can see that in uh, the tertiary structure of proteins as well. Uh, when we look at proteins, I will point it out. In figure 210A, uh, this shows the hydrogen bonding between polar water molecules. So there we can see different uh, water molecules. And uh, so the way it works is that the oxygen from one molecule of water, remember that the oxygen end, which is slightly electronegative, is going to be attracted to the uh, slightly electropositive end of the hydrogen atom uh, from, uh, from, another, from another water molecule. Uh, and uh, and this goes on with all these water uh, these molecules of uh, of water, and that's what makes water liquid. Um, figure two ten b shows hydrogen bonding between polar water molecules again. In this, uh, so in the previous example, we saw it at the molecular level, and here we see the result of that uh, of those hydrogen bonds because it holds it uh, because the hydrogen bonds keeps all the water molecules together. Something as light as a water strider can walk on a pond uh, because of the high surface tension of water. And, uh, and which is a result of the combined strength of all the hydrogen bonds. And um, that's it for uh, this section of uh, Unit 2, Chapter 2A.